We're here at Mobile World Congress 2019 in Barcelona, and I have the pleasure of being joined by Fernanda Mendes, who's the head of management orchestration and Cenex. Fernanda, great to see you. Thank you, Des, for having me. This is fantastic. I'm so excited to be here. And likewise, and, and also thank you so much for being on my podcast recently, but we won't get into that. Yeah. Now, uh, firstly, this is an amazing event. Lots of flashing lights, uh, big week here, thousands of people behind us. What can you tell us about what's on the uh, Ericsson Pavilion from your part of Ericsson? Well, that's I'm so excited because actually we're one of the best uh, um, introductions. We have the best introduction now in, in terms of 5G platform. Right. Uh, my part in this uh, in this deal is Evolve Dynamic Orchestration. So okay. with Evolve Dynamic Orchestration, is part of the 5G core platform that we're launching here in uh, more World Congress. What, what it allows us to do is basically automate a lot of the, uh, the functions uh, in order to get us from weeks two minutes from months to hours. A lot of things that we need to automate as part of the introduction of 5G. Awesome, now I want to get back into that uh, uh, from uh, weeks to minutes and months to hours in a moment. Um, you've got two job titles. I want to focus on the Senex bit. Um, I mean, the head of management orchestration is a massive title, but we won't get into that. Let's talk about Senex. Firstly, just give us a quick summary of the Senex acquisition. What's that journey been like? It's, for me, it's been an incredible experience. We bring uh, fantastic technology from the Senex company. Uh, what it has been uh, done, what's been doing for us is that we're bringing that machine learning, enabling closed loop automation right. into our evolved dynamic orchestration story. In the past, what we've been very good at is basically instantiating new services, enabling our customers mm -hmm. to basically introduce new services, to shorten the time to market, to revenue, right. as an example. And those things we have been successfully doing for the past uh, you know, three, four years now, yeah, yeah. with 54 plus customers now being uh, wow. deploying our, our uh, solution. And, and all of this is fantastic. For our for our customers, for us to enable you know more growth yeah. uh, in the 5G uh, area as well, but we were missing one critical piece that now Cenex comes uh, brings to us. Right. And that critical piece is the ability to do the closed loop automation. Okay. What is closed loop automation? I was about to ask you that. Yeah, I figure that. You know, what typically in the past we do is that we monitor the network, we expose all of that information, those key parameters mm -hmm. that are important to monitor. We flag them, you know, we flag the faults, and we say, hey, by the way, there is a fault somewhere in the network. Right. Go find out what's going on. So. And, and that's all good, but it's very time consuming. You have a lot of people kind of looking yeah. at this monitor, just you know, seeing how things are going in the network. Closed loop automation means now we're able to gather that information, talk to orchestration, and trigger actions that okay. will actually resolve right. the problem in a more automatic way. And that's what basically machine learning, closed loop automation enables. The ability to react fast yeah. and solve and fix problems that are basically out there uh, in, in the network without having to you know, have loads and loads of eyes looking at monitors. Well, that's the thing I'm getting from uh, where we're going now with, with 5G in particular, that the speed and scale and the breadth that we're bringing to the market, uh, even just with the mobile broadband and the number of handset devices, but when you add autonomous things, you know, little things delivering pizzas, big trains and trucks and airplanes, billions and billions of sensors, whether they're smart or dumb sensors, all of the data moving, all of that infrastructure, all the network, and now the network's software defined. So we're not sort of moving RJ45 switches and around the place and cables. Uh, people don't necessarily have to go out in the field. Things are instantiated almost instantly, run for a period of time, and then burnt down, right? The scale of that is almost, oh, I imagine it's beyond human, so this is where it's very critical what you're doing now is automated. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you, I mean, I hope you had the chance to go and pass by our area. So we have this fantastic game that we set up just to visualize that for right. our customers. Customers, right. So the, the the game is very simple. What we do is that we we put the customer under the test. Right. Right. And we tell them, well, listen, like that. how about you know we start uh, managing two slices. Right. right. You have uh, two industries you want to address. Let's say the transport and manufacturing, and and you start managing those two slices with your current ways of working. And then the customer starts basically automating and instantiating these slices, okay. right? Two, you know, manageable, you can you can see the customer going, yeah, I can I can do this, right? But then you said, okay, you passed the first test, now let's take you to the next level. Right. Well, you're winning more business, everybody's realizing that, you know, you, you are fast, 
you, you introduce new services really great, and you automate, and the total cost of ownership for your end users are, are improving. So therefore, you're winning more business. More slices, right. more industries are coming your way. So therefore, you have another two or three more, more industries you want to slice your network for. Mm -hmm. So you start, then he starts getting bombarded <laughs> with like different type of slices, big and small, and they can't catch up. Sure. They can't yeah. catch up. How do I now enable all of this business yeah. with, with my network in a, in a more automatic way? Manually, I can't do it. Just so can't juggle that many things, right? Just can't juggle that many things yeah. in, a, in, a, in the previous ways of manually instantiating things provisioning uh, slices or even visualizing them, right? And you've got human error, uh, you've got people doing break, fix the typos. Absolutely. All those things. I mean, and you could see it in real time in the game. They, they get overwhelmed <laughs> with it, right? I can't wait and to try it. It's fantastic. You go, you have to go and try it. And that basically is, is the perfect uh, um, the perfect time to take them to our Evolve yep. Dynamic Orchestration booth. Then we, we present to them how we can help them go from the whole manual process that they've been dealing with in the past right. and automate it for a way that they can introduce more of these services real time. So underpinning all of this, I mean, there's a, a theme that's coming out of this around the whole automation component and the orchestration. And we've seen this in, uh, I guess, in other industry groups around, you know, web scale, cloud, and, and sort of the, the typical unicorns where they have continuous development and continuous improvement, agile sort of DevOps space, fail and fail fast. Right. Is it fair to say that now you've really brought that into the telco space and, and to deal with the scale and the speed and the diversity? Because even just when you're talking about basic network slices, although it's probably unfair, but basic network slicing and the volume, when you start adding different levels of services and types of services, and then you've got everything from mobile broadband and handsets and voice calls through to data and different types of data for a long haul, short haul, IoT. I mean, it's so complex and so massive. I imagine underpinning this now, the whole automation and orchestration piece is not just a nicety, it's a necessity. Absolutely. Perfect example. So, in our Evolve Dynamic Orchestration launch, we have five critical items, uh, functionalities that we're introducing. Okay. One of them is exactly what you're referring in uh, continuous integration, continuous depo deployment. Right. So, when we talk about weeks to minutes, mm -hmm. this is what we refer to. We right. are able to now make basically a deployed software and roll out software in, in minutes instead of yeah. what it used to take weeks or even months to, okay. to do a simple software upgrade. What happens is that now the complexity of our own software solutions, even though we are improving a lot of functionality, new functionality coming in, we also go in cloud native. Yep. We are we have a diversity of environments that we need to validate our software right, on. Right. Either virtualized, cloud, or even physical, you know, yep. traditional type of uh, networks. Now with this diversity of environments, we need to be able to basically roll this software out there mm -hmm. in a much more automatic way. Yeah. We should be able to lifecycle manage that. What, what that means is introduce the software, test it, validate it, upgrade it, and decommission it sure. or terminate uh, the, if necessary. And in all of that in a more automatic way, less costly. Yeah, and yeah. and for, for customers, they shouldn't need to wait you know, two cycles a year yeah, to be able yeah. to get the newest and greatest functionality we have to offer. We should be able to roll this software out in a similar way that the Agile okay. mentality brings to us, which is in a more continuous, real-time manner. And that's what we're accomplishing today with one of our functional uh, functionality in our Evolve Dynamic Orchestration. It's called the Cloud Deployment Engine. Okay. And that allows us to basically have much faster rollout, software right. rollouts. I like that. Well, the term cloud deployment uh, almost self-describes that you are uh, adhering to those cloud native models. You've got dockerized uh, uh, applications and containerized. You've got them running on Kubernetes. They're running on your OpenStack cloud. You've done some amazing work within OpenStack as part of the community uh, in the open source world to make it telco ready. Exactly. The other thing that strikes me with this is uh, you're now in the position where you can not only do centralized data center uh, single site, but you can do multiple types of deployment. So you can do distributed deployment. So centralized data centers, on-prem, off-prem okay. hybrid, you can do it on the side of a pole, uh, inside industry uh, focused area, so maybe a robotics site, a mining site, transport, airports. What can you tell us about what that model brings? And I guess the complexity that that introduces, which I imagine Cenex's capability now makes a lot easier to manage. Much easier to visualize all, the, the, all those different models because yeah. what, what distributed cloud environments bring to us and what 
all of these multiple industries that we're now slicing the network for, yep. it, it creates specific requirements where we should be placing workloads, right? Right, it's right. dynamic orchestration, what we yep. bring with another uh, functionality that's being launched today is our Edison service orchestration in dynamic orchestration. I saw that, right? that was amazing. It's amazing because what, we, what allows us to do is to have a smart workload placement independent right. of where the workload is being placed, whether right. it's close to the edge, whether it's uh, centralized, whether it's in the public cloud. Because okay. depending on the workload, the, yep. the total cost of ownership required, the closeness or the, uh, the latency requirements yep. that the, uh, the use case may have, then we need to decide where we put the software application in order to shorten the latency and be able to meet the requirements and the service level agreements that we have with that customer or that end user. Okay. So service orchestration allows us to, in a, a smart way, place these workloads. But when we talked about smart, what does smart mean? Well, mm -hmm. how does service orchestration knows where to put it? Right. That's where Senex, the combination of the Senex information that's visualizing the network, yep. that is constantly monitoring, for instance, the network KPIs. Okay. And he knows whether in this location I have the latency, the throughput that yep. I require versus in another location. So with that information, we bring two worlds. The information of the different KPIs that are needed for specific uh, requirements and KPIs for, uh, for a service. Mm -hmm. And the ability to instantiate it in a smart way in that location. Okay. So those Fantastic. two combined gives us what we discussed before: the ability to automate where we put things yeah. in a smart way. I like it. Now I want to come back to the whole uh, leveraging of machine learning in a moment to wrap up. But firstly, a couple of things you touched on there, uh, just to validate. I mean. When we think about the deployments now, they're, they're not just multi-region, they're global. Uh, we are now in a very complex, challenging world with things around data protection, data sovereignty. Uh, so I imagine that what you're offering now uh, with a combination of that whole end-to-end -end solution allows us to look at the price points, performance points, some of the you know, break, fix, automated, uh, self-healing, but also take into context, where am I running the workload? Am I allowed to move that data there? Uh, if it's in Australia, is, is it a federal government uh, agency or client? Can that move in and out of the country? No, it needs to run locally. Um, is it needing to be GDPR compliant? Is it the case that that also now encompasses all of that? I mean, not necessarily a, a single tick in the box, but that complexity of not just the commercial or, tech, or the technical benefits from a price or performance point of view, but also regulatory and, and governance controls. Right. Exactly, so it, it empowers our customers to decide right. where and why they should put things in the network, geographically speaking, yep. either because of security reasons. But what is even more important is that because of these potential security or geographical restrictions, they're able to have a single orchestrator, as an example, right. that can manage their network independent of which location, yep. which area they are, it, it diminishes the learning curve of the people that right. are operating this network because they don't need to learn many, many orchestrators yeah, or many, yeah. many other uh, closed loop automation type of functionality or tools to operate this network. It's a single learning curve that can yep. be leveraged across many geographies, across many, many entities, data centers, and so on. So this is one of the things that are empowering our customers to, for, from a total cost of ownership perspective, as well as deciding where they need to put their workloads, depending when, where they want to ring fence right. their, their assets yeah, as yeah. part of secure, for security reasons, as an example. I like it. I mean, we hear this term, uh, single pane of glass. It seems to me a lot of what you're building now gives us that single pane of glass capability. All the tools are there. It's a dashboard. As you said, you don't have to have multi-tool, multi-skill. Mm -hmm. uh, last quick question, because I know uh, we're, we're running a little over time. Machine learning, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence. I'd like to just maybe wrap up with a clarification around the type of artificial intelligence, because I think when people think about this thing, Skynet and robots, but you're leveraging machine learning and data science and, and modeling data to, to look at where are these trends and where can you get ahead of them. And I, I suspect aim for the predictive component, right? Get away from reactive and move to predictive. Tell us a little bit about how, where that fits into this whole story. Uh, yes, Des. So, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, we, we tend to think, like you said, the Skynet, you know, the, 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 yeah, the yeah. robot out there in the sky that will fix everything for us. Well, here, we're, we're not really saying this is where, where we're doing today, but we're doing basic things that yeah. are, are creating incredible, incredible automation gains for the customer. So we bring machine learning algorithms, mm -hmm. for instance, as the basic principles yeah. to automate operational processes in the network. 
One of the biggest challenges we had in the past uh, years is that technology in the network is being rapidly advancing, mm -hmm. um, but operations has been static. Right. 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 And and even though we are having software-defined networking. The uh, operational support layer is being pretty much fixed. Right. So these two don't add up to become more agile to yep, introduce yep. new revenue streams for the operator. So where machine learning uh, comes into place is how we automate these operational processes to catch up Perfect. with the advancement of software-defined networking, as an example. And we've been like low-hanging fruit. Machine learning algorithms, data scientists are looking at how we operate networks in a manual way, mm -hmm. and how we can actually create algorithms to basically just automate all these very repeatable processes yeah. that should not be in place. It should be removed, it should be very much automatic, and at the same time, as we mentioned, we reduced it from months yes. to weeks, or from weeks to minutes. I right? love it, that's fantastic. Well, thank you, I really appreciate it, because we get a lot of questions from uh, the audience around, you know, when we're talking about artificial intelligence, what do you actually mean? And I, I really appreciate you just explaining where machine learning's being applied, because uh, there's a lot of myths, a lot of unknowns, and I think it's great to just clarify machine learning is, is another tool, right. as is data, as is security. Well, it's been fantastic to see you, Fernanda, and thank you so much for thank making you so much for time available, team. And uh, look, you know, I can't wait to go and get my hands on that uh, oh, game you have referred to, to and play. some of things. Yeah. But I think it's a, it's a given already that um, Mobile World Congress 2019 is already a massive success for you and your team. Congratulations. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Okay.